Thanks, Megan. Hi, everyone. Come on in, grab a seat, and open up your handout. And we're going to be looking at this passage from Matthew's account of Jesus' life. So we picked up the story of, in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus goes up on a mountainside. His disciples come with him. That is, the people who are follow him and learn from him. But also following Jesus up the mountain are a crowd of people interested in what Jesus is doing and saying. And so you have two groups of people listening to these words of Jesus. On one hand, you have the disciples already committed to Jesus' cause, to following Jesus and learning from him and obeying his teaching. And then around them, listening in as well, the crowd of people. And this crowd are not yet disciples, but they're interested. They're interested in Jesus. They want to find out more about Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus. So I figure as we listen to these words over the next few weeks and this week, uh, these words are good for two kinds of people. They're good for those who are already followers of Jesus. So if that's you, here is something important for you to hear as someone who follows Jesus. And also these words are good for those who are interested in Jesus. That is, you may not be a follower yet, but you might want to find out more. What would be involved? Why would I want to become a Christian? Why would I take the step of putting my trust in Jesus? These words today will help you, I think, to do that. So as we hear these words, we're going to hear a gracious call, a gracious call and also an enormous challenge. And this is what we heard last week as we heard Jesus begin to address the disciples and the crowds. Because Jesus, on one hand, was bringing the blessing of God on these people. He was announcing that God's blessing was on certain kinds of people, especially those who are struggling and suffering, those who are strange and persecuted. Jesus was announcing God's blessing on these kinds of people, not because of anything that they'd done, but because actually they were in trouble and they needed God and they knew that they needed God. And so Jesus was announcing God's blessing on them. But at the same time, there was also a very considerable challenge because Jesus was talking about the kind of people who would be part of God's kingdom, the kind of people who would see God, people who were merciful, people who were pure of heart, people who were seeking peace, people who hungered and thirsted for righteousness, people who were so much on about God's stuff uh, that they were, could be considered pure in heart. So there was a huge challenge there as well. At the same time, there was a gracious call to belong to God and receive his blessing, and there was an enormous challenge as well. And we're going to see the same thing here. Jesus very graciously calls his disciples to a special role in the world. Jesus very generously makes these people part of God's plans for blessing the world. And at the same time, he is going to challenge them. He's going to challenge us as we hear it. He's going to challenge us very deeply with the kind of people that we are in order to be that blessing to the world. So let's have a look at it together, but be prepared, as I say, for to hear both the grace of God in your life and also the challenge of God in your life as Jesus speaks. Jesus says that his followers are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Let's think about what he means. What is it to be the salt of the earth? Well, you may know that in the ancient world, salt was most importantly used for preserving for preserving food. Uh, by salting food, you could prevent it from going rotten. And this would be incredibly helpful, provide you with food when food was scarce, if you had things that were put away that had been salted, fish or meat or olives or whatever it might be, this could see you through the winter time. This could see you through the hard times. This could enable you to go on a journey. These kinds of things uh, would help you uh, in ancient society because of no freezers, no refrigerators, nothing like that. And so to be the salt of the earth means at the very least to be part of uh, stopping the world from going rotten, from becoming as bad as it might be, for stopping the world from going putrid. That is, because human beings are in rebellion against God, because we turn away from God, there is a tendency for human life and human society to get worse, to go bad, to go rot. There's no necessary reason why the world should be getting better and better 
And in fact, the potential is there for it to get worse and worse. You might think of perhaps the description of the society of Noah's day in Gen- back in Genesis chapter 6. That the thoughts of people's hearts were always evil all the time. It had degenerated to the worst possible point. And the same can go for human society at any stage. Uh, I think I've told you previously about Peter Hitchens' book, The Rage Against God. Do you know Peter Hitchens? He is uh, a Christian journalist and his brother was Christopher Hitchens. And Christopher Hitchens was that uh, slightly eccentric and grumpy and cantankerous atheist, whereas Peter Hitchens is a slightly eccentric and cantankerous and grumpy Christian <laughs> of the two brothers. Right? So you can see that there was something going on in that family that made people a bit grumpy and, uh, and awkward in some ways. But uh, these were both people very passionate and intelligent about their beliefs. And Peter Hitchens... Uh, wrote his book, uh, The Rage Against God, in part recounting how he came to Christian faith. How he came to Christian faith. And it's a very unusual story because he says the thing that really triggered it off, the thing that prompted him in the beginning to reassess what he believed and to think again about Jesus as a, you know, as a middle-aged adult was the time he spent as a correspondent in Moscow during the communist years, and uh, then in Mogadishu uh, during uh, the the period of chaos in Mogadishu when the United Nations mission went in there uh, back in the 1990s, 1980s and 1990s. Uh, What does he say about his time there? Well, the thing was that his time spent in Moscow and Mogadishu made him realise that there was no necessary reason why society, any society, would continue to develop and improve. That there's no necessary reason why it shouldn't go backwards and disintegrate. One of the things he observed in Moscow was about the Russian language during the time that he was there. Uh, And that was that the Russian language under communism had become incredibly coarse. People spoke to each other in negative, nasty ways. Just the common use of language was itself vulgar and coarse. There was something about the society that had degenerated and that the language was part of that and symbolic of that. That The the beautiful Russian language that Hitchens knew from uh, his education and reading, you know, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and so on, uh, had become a language which was uh, itself, you know, basically very mean and interested in only the most base things. But this has been the long-term effect of communism on the nation. And you might remember George Orwell made some observations about this, that uh, language is really important because language contains the possibilities for a society. The language that a group of people uses uh, carries all kinds of ideas and values and possibilities. And when you, when language degenerates, then the society itself loses its sense of what it might be, of its ideals, of its possibilities. So in Moscow, uh, Hitchens saw you know, a society that had gone backwards significantly uh, during a time when atheism was the official doctrine of the nation. And then he flew into Mogadishu much more briefly uh, during this time. And uh, he knew that this had been a beautiful city. This was called uh, the Pearl of the Horn of Africa. This, was, this had been a, a, a beautiful city in many ways. And it had degenerated into total chaos. If you've ever seen the film Black Hawk Down, you'll see Mogadishu at its worst, that here a beautiful city had become, over the course of about 10 years, a miserable hellhole to live in. It had become an utter disaster for the people who lived there. And so Hitchens realised, well, there's no reason why society would keep getting better and better. Actually, something holds society, something keeps it from getting worse. It, it, It only happens because of a deliberate decision of the people who are part of it. And in particular, he started to realise that it was Christianity that had sustained the society that he had grown up in and that he had valued in England as a child. And so it started getting him thinking about Jesus. So Christians are called to be the salt of the earth. Jesus' followers are meant to be those who help preserve the world from becoming worse than it is. And so insofar as we live in a way that stops society getting worse, stops evil 
actions from becoming more normal, then Christians are actually acting to preserve the world. Salt also, of course, is about taste. That salt is the most basic thing that makes food taste good. And, uh, you know, we don't no longer have to preserve food with salt, but we still do sometimes just because it's so darn good. Next time you eat bacon, you might want to reflect on this, or olives, or anchovies. I know this is a divisive issue for many. But when you get that fantastic flavour explosion as you bite into a piece of pizza with an anchovy on it, remember, yes. <laughs> That is what Jesus is calling you to be. Uh, Christians are meant to make the world more savoury, that life, when Christians are present, is actually a better experience for people than it might have been. A better experience than it might. That a life which may have been a burden that's too heavy for people to bear becomes something that people can live with, that put up with, because of the presence of Christians. Job Uh, In Job chapter 6, verse 6, asks the people that he's speaking to, can that which is tasteless be eaten without salt? Uh, Well, can life be lived if there is no presence of Christians helping it to be better than it might have been? That's the challenge that Jesus is putting forward, that Christians would actually add savour, would add flavour, to make the world less bland than it might have been without their presence. To preserve the world and to add taste to the world. Think of what Paul tells the Colossians in chapter 4, verse 6 of his letter to them. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. Salt here is an image of making something more palatable or acceptable. Life improves when Christians live as Jesus calls them to live. Now, I want you to notice, on one hand, this is a very ambitious program that Jesus is putting out there for his followers. In fact, he's just speaking to a very small group of people at this point, and yet he's saying to them that they have a worldwide commission from him to be the salt of the earth, salt of the whole world. So Christians are called in every place, at every time, to be preservers, to be flavourers of the world. But it's also, in some ways, a limited commission. That is, Jesus is not telling Christians that they are meant to be the people who save the world, who put everything right. It's it's a more limited vision than that to say that Christians are salt. That is, the call is to preserve the world, to keep it from becoming as bad as it might be, to make it more tolerable and acceptable to people. So sometimes we speak in over-ambitious ways actually about what Christians might achieve and what Christians might do. Not here to save the world, not here to put everything right. In fact, unfortunately, even in our best attempts, we will contribute to the amount of sin and evil in the world. And we just need to see that we are not the ones who are going to save the world, that God saves the world through Jesus and he brings his kingdom into the world and he does that actually sometimes apart from us and despite us. Christians are not the ones who build God's kingdom. God brings his kingdom to the world. So sometimes we might say something like, for example, let's make poverty history. You know the slogan, make poverty history. Now, in many ways, this is a very good cause. It's a very noble sentiment that we should make poverty history. But I think in some ways it actually aims too high, aims too high, that until God's kingdom comes, there will be poverty in the world. There will be poverty in the world because human beings will continue to do evil. So much human poverty is the result of human sin. There will always be poverty until God's kingdom comes. And yet we should be striving to alleviate poverty wherever we can. So I know that if we came up with a slogan to capture this, it just wouldn't be the same. Let's minimise the amount of poverty in the world as much as we can, even though we won't <laughs> completely eradicate it. That's, it's not going to catch people's, it's not going to have to catch people's hearts. And yet, uh, we do need to be realistic here about what Jesus is calling us to. It is a worldwide effect that Christians are meant to have, uh, but it is not saving the world, but merely preserving the world from what it, the worst that it might become. 
So Christians are called to do this and to be this in the world. I think it's worth saying a little bit about secularism and the idea of secularism in this context. Uh, because as you may know, sometimes people say if we live in a secular society, there is really no place for religious people to be openly religious and to try and you know, change the world or change the society in any way. Uh, that's not what a secular society is about. And I want to say, look, I actually think that is a misunderstanding of secularism and uh, what it's meant to mean. And when we talk about secularism, lots of people use this, this word in different ways, and that need, needs to be acknowledged. But we need to say that when we talk about secular, a secular society in terms of a secular nation or a secular institution like the university, we're not saying that it means an absence of religion or religious people or Christians in particular. What we're saying is secular society has no established religion. That is, that the government is not going to favour one particular religion or one particular denomination. It's not going to have that as the established religion, the official religion. So this university has no established or official religion. Uh, this, this nation doesn't either. And I think most Christians would say that's actually okay. That's okay. Uh, but it, that doesn't mean, because there's no established religion, does not mean that religious people, and Christians in particular, don't have a part to play, that they can't publicly be who they are and openly who they are and contribute to the good of that society. So we mustn't let the idea of secularism stop us from being salt to the society that we're in. That you are called to be salt wherever you are, to be salt to the world, to be salt to Melbourne, to be salt to the suburb that you live in, the community that you're part of, to be salt here at the university. To be publicly a follower of Jesus, seeking to ensure that the place that you're in does not become as bad as it might be without your presence. And so that, that is the call of Jesus to us. Jesus also says that we are to be the light of the world. The light of the world. What's this about? Well, of course, light and darkness are very common metaphors in the world and also in the Bible. Uh, they, you know, light stands for knowledge rather than ignorance and stands for good rather than evil. But the light that Jesus is talking about here, I think, is especially the light of salvation, the light of the good news that God is at work saving his people, that God has made himself known, that God wants to be known, that God is calling people to him to be forgiven and belong to him, and so on. The light that Jesus is talking about here is the good news that there is a God who saves his people. So listen, for example, to Matthew chapter 4. This is from the previous chapter. I'll read from verse 13. After leaving Nazareth, Jesus went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And here he quotes from Isaiah, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. And then Matthew adds, verse 17, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The light that Isaiah spoke of, the light that Matthew says has now come in Jesus, is the light of salvation, the good news that God is now acting to rescue and save his people. Of course, Jesus himself is the light of the world in the first place. He is the one who brings God's salvation and the news of God's salvation into the world. And then Jesus' followers also become the light to the world. They make known that there is a God and there is a God who saves. Uh, and Jesus uses another image to fill out what he means here. He says, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Now, some of you are going, hold on, this is too much for me. Uh, Jesus is using a metaphor to explain another metaphor. I'm not an art student. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> I, know you, I know you can actually all cope with this. All of your disciplines use multiple metaphors 
and mix them up. The next time you think about you know getting on the net and the web and the cloud and all of that at once, <laughs> that stuff. Uh, you're mixing your metaphors, aren't you? Are you? Is it the net or the web? I, and where's the cloud? How's the cloud fit in the web? I can't, you can cope with that, I can't cope with that. Okay, so Jesus uses two metaphors here. The second one is the city on the hill. When Jesus' hearers would have heard the city on the hill, they would have thought about a particular city. Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a city on a hill. Jerusalem, the prophet said, was placed in the middle of the nations. It was on the hill there in the middle of the nations. Symbolically speaking, it was there for the whole world to see. It was meant to be the city that showed the glory of God to the rest of the world. And yet, of course, Jerusalem had failed to do that. And here Jesus is saying that his followers are the light of the world. They are the Jerusalem, the real Jerusalem, the city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So in both ways, Jesus is really saying, look to his followers, you guys are now the way that God is going to show his truth to the world. The good news of salvation will come through the people of Jesus. In particular, it will come through the good things that they do, the good works that they do. And this category, good works, is just the broadest category for living the life that God calls you to, for doing the things, for leading the righteous life that God calls us to. That's all good works. When people see the way you live in response to Jesus, they will get to know the truth about God. And what is the truth about God in particular that Jesus has in mind? Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. What is the truth about God that will be revealed? Jesus says it's the truth that God is our heavenly Father. And here we come again to the most distinctive aspect of Jesus' teaching, the thing that really makes his teaching stand out. Much of what Jesus is saying here in the sermon is in its way gathering together what was already there in the law and the prophets that the people of Israel had. The thing that is most startling, the thing that stands out most, is the way Jesus talks about God. God is Jesus' Father, and Jesus graciously offers to introduce us, his followers, to his Heavenly Father, that we also can become children of the Heavenly Father. This is the stunning truth that Jesus reveals, that the true God... The God of Israel, the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt, that God is the Heavenly Father. That God can be known as Father. And Jesus comes to reveal the Father, to show what the Father is really like and to put us in contact, to give us access to the Heavenly Father. Apart from Jesus, we cannot know the Father, or come to the Father, but he is the one who reveals the Father to us. And the whole object of this, the whole aim of this, Jesus says, is <coughs> what? To give glory to our Heavenly Father. The goal of our lives, the goal of where this is headed, is that we and that others who see our light would become worshippers of the Heavenly Father. We'd become people who give glory to the Father who acknowledge his greatness and proclaim his greatness in the world. This is what it means to truly know God and worship God. Remember the conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well? This is in John chapter 4. True worship, Jesus tells her, is to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. People in the world don't know God. They don't know the truth about God. But in Jesus we find the Father. So I want to say to you, if you're with us today and you're not a Christian, uh, that this is, I think, the most important thing that Jesus says and the thing that I think is most helpful for you to hear. That you, whoever you are, were made to know God. You were made for a relationship with God. And you were made for a particular relationship with God. You were meant to know God as your Father. And you were made to be God's child. And so if you'll come to Jesus and put your trust in Jesus, then you also will become a child of God and get to know the Father in heaven. You hear the challenge that's here. Yes, if you become a Christian, there will be a significant challenge in your life to be salt and light to the whole world. 
But first of all, it's a gracious call to you to come through Jesus to know God the Father. Well, here in his teaching, Jesus raises the possibility that his followers might fail to do this. What does he say? But if salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Can it? Do pe- uh, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but put it on a stand. In each case, both salt and light, Jesus raises the possibility that it might not work, it might not happen, that things might not turn out the way that Jesus says. That people who are meant to be salt might lose their saltiness, that people who are meant to be light might hide their light, and that the people of Jesus might fail to be what they're meant to be. And it's important for us, I think, to hear this possibility. Jesus, in some ways, says it's an impossibility. You can't hide a city that, that's on a hill. No one would light a light and put it under a basket. It's not going to happen, but it could happen, wouldn't it? Here is the challenge, that we mustn't take it for granted that we really will be salt and light without actually putting effort into it. There are, I think, three ways that we might fail to be salt and light in the world. One is, one is the failure to be different, that we might fail to be different from the society around us. How can we be a preservative to the world if we are just like the world? How can we give light to the world? How can we show the truth about salvation if we are just like the world? And always, all the time, the church has been pressured, the followers of Jesus are being pressured to actually conform to the world and cease being different. And you will know that this is true in lots of ways. For example, uh, and it comes out in all the things that Jesus has been teaching about, we are tempted to be people who embrace conflict, that we will be people who don't get on with each other, that we'll disagree with each other, that we'll fight with each other, that we'll slander each other, that we'll act maliciously to each other. This is going on in the world all the time. And there are lots of churches and lots of Christians who are saying, well, we, we could get a bit of that action as well. Why don't, we, why don't we do that in our church? Let's have a good fight. <laughs> yeah? And of course... A church where that happens or a group where that happens will cease to be salt and light to the world. Or, similarly, the world is full of greed. People grasping stuff for themselves. And it is so easy for the church, for Christians to become people who just live in exactly the same way. Our lives are just about acquisition. We just are grabbing more and more, building our wealth, that's, that's our obsession, that's our thing. Our houses are full of stuff. We're just like the world around. How can we be salt and light if we are just as greedy as the people around us? And similarly, of course, with our attitude to sex and sexuality, that the pressure is on to conform, but if we conform to the world's expectations, then what do we have to offer? What good news is there in our lives that they might learn there's a failure to be different. There might also be a failure to be engaged. That is, you might be very different from the world, but because you're so separate from the world and cut off from the world, you actually have no influence. You aren't salt and light to the world because you are separate from the world. Sometimes Christians have made themselves separate. They've separated themselves and cut themselves off from the world in order to preserve their difference and their holiness, but then they fail to be salt and light. So here's the challenge to be distinctive but not separate. And very often Christians have failed in one or two of these directions. And the the third way of failing, I think, would be a failure to be active, to actually be doing the good works that lead people to a knowledge of God, that lead to be salt and light. So here we are, we see that Christians are called to be an outstanding people. Not outstanding individuals, actually, but an outstanding people. That just as the people of Israel were called to be God's way of blessing the whole world, here the followers of Jesus are rebooting the mission of Israel. The the followers of Jesus are restarting. Well, Jesus is starting by calling his followers. He's restarting the mission of Israel to be a light to the world 
and salt to the earth. Not just individual Christians living outstanding lives, but an, indivi- uh, an outstanding people, a people of God here at the university, in your suburbs, where your churches are, and outstanding people who are a blessing to the society around them, to be salt and light. So this is the call of Jesus on our lives. This is the challenge of Jesus on how we are to live. Jesus has given you and me, us together, a worldwide mission. Now this is not the only, it's not the first and not the last word about the mission of God's people in Matthew's Gospel. Back in chapter 4, Jesus already called the disciples to be fishers of people, that they were going to fish for people. In chapter 10, we're going to see Jesus send the disciples out on mission in the world, and he's going to tell them a whole bunch of things about that. Chapter 16, Jesus is going to call on his people to take up their cross and follow him. The cross of Jesus is going to shape our lives in various ways. And of course, in Matthew 28, Jesus is going to commission the disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations. So this is not the only thing to be said about Christian mission in the world. But it's a very important thing, a very helpful thing for us to hear. That we are to be salt and that we are to be light for the whole world. I'm going to pray uh, that we might be able to be that and then I think we've got some time for questions. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you first of all for the gracious call of Jesus that we should know you as our Father and that we should worship you as our Heavenly Father and that we should be your children. We thank you for your mercy and grace that calls us to belong to you. We thank you also for this mission, for this challenge to be salt and light for the sake of the world. And we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit we would live such excellent lives that together we should be such outstanding people that the world would be blessed and preserved from evil and that the knowledge of your salvation would spread in all places and right here at Melbourne Uni. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.